Thank you for participating in this interview. Our first question. You insist that philosophers should study a history of philosophy, that such a study could be very useful. Why do you think so? Can you explain your position? Uh, I wasn't expecting to be talking about that, but I think that uh, I have a somewhat divided sense about studying the history of philosophy. I think that many people today, certainly in the U.S. and the U.K., and even more so, I think, in Australia, uh, begin with no knowledge of the history of philosophy, except maybe a kind of cultural sense of past figure. They do very well. Uh, but I do think, despite that, that it can be very useful for people to study the history of philosophy, and I think that that's true for several reasons. Uh, one reason is the great historical figures uh, developed philosophical positions in a very systematic way, and it's the building of a system which is not done very much in philosophy today. Uh, it's the building of a system that I think can be very useful for people studying philosophy uh, today. Because if you merge yourself in the system, then you really, it, it, it's a good way and a quick way to see some of the great interconnections among different issues to get some sympathy and some comfort moving one issue to another issue, uh, and being able to develop these connections in a fruitful way. But there's another thing which I think is a bit more subtle, and uh, but I think is a genuine use studying the history of philosophy. So I think we all have to understand each other by interpreting one another, don't think that this is a completely easy process when topic is very struck as it typically is well. So if you say something, I have to interpret it. If you say something, you have to interpret it. How do we do this interpret? Well, I think the way we do it is, again, back of our own prior rules. So, if I am studying the work in the history of philosophy, I actually have to think about the issue that that work is discussing. Otherwise, I won't be able to have the necessary background to do that. I just won't have anywhere to go. So if you give the critique of pure reason to somebody who hasn't thought about philosophy at all, it just won't make sense. Mm -hmm. And there's a very interesting passage in Arch the English philosopher R.T. Collingwood as an intellectual autobiography. And it says his father had all of these books in his library. He read them from a very young age, and he, he was fluent in English, French, and German, Greek. And then he came across the critique for me, and he simply didn't understand what was going on. And I take it that he didn't understand what was going on because he thought about those issues. So he didn't have his own beliefs by way of which to interpret the text of what Kant's text. Uh, so I think studying the history of philosophy, this is one to think about Jews that one might not have thought of before. So I think there are these two ways which study the history of philosophy can be useful. Though I do think that it is true that many people uh, have 
the outstanding careers in philosophy without paying any attention to this gift so we don't and never having studied. Yeah, speaking about the intellectual uh, biographies of philosophers, uh, can you uh, tell us uh, about uh, your way to philosophy? How did you come to philosophy, in particular the philosophy of mind? Well, I came to my own interest in philosophy developed in a somewhat circuitous roundabout in way. Um, I didn't was going to go into the academic school and went to college. Uh, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. Mm. I thought to be a psychiatrist, but I would have first medical school. But since I was going to be dealing with it, I ought to have a grant in history and philosophy. And so I was at the history major because that allowed me to more philosophy then it was more flexible. I was in the philosophy made couldn't have become so much history. Anyway, uh, I simply lost interest in going to school, and I was interested in being a second interest. I went to school in philosophy, and I think probably the fact that I originally been interested in the mind led me into the philosophy. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you are uh, one of the uh, most prominent uh, uh, defender of the uh, high order theory. So, uh, what was, uh, how did you come to the high order theory of consciousness? Uh, I came to the high order theory of consciousness when I was writing an article defending my body theory. Uh, I haven't been interested in issues about mind and materialism for very many years, but this was a long time ago. I guess this must have been in the early 80s. And I thought I had this argument, this argument, this argument in favor of mind and materialism. And I thought, what will Holmes reject mind body? Was, what will they study again? And I thought, oh, they will talk about consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what will I say about consciousness? And I came back with the outline of this theory, which I've been developing ever since. And I think the key to the theory, the key to all their theories of consciousness, is to distinguish between mental states that occur consciously and mental states that don't occur. Because I think that the major alternative to a higher order theory, which has come to be called a first order theory, is first order theory, they have a great variety of them. Uh, they have a very different time explaining how it can be that mental states occur both consciously not conscious. Um, and I, that's key to seeing what virtues are of the higher order here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, one of the main principles of your high order theory is the transitivity principle. And uh, it suggests uh, uh, that uh, uh, a mental state is conscious only if one is in some way aware of it. Well, this statement may be taken uh, by someone either like a tautology or uh, it may seem to go against the common sense. For instance, uh, someone can interpret the words awareness and consciousness as synonyms. Then the statement is trivial. Or alternatively, it seems that, uh, that uh, for instance, I may be angry uh, but nevertheless not aware of my anger. At this state, I may be yelling and, at somebody and demonstrating other sorts of angry behaviors, but I am not conscious. Uh, uh, but uh, am I not conscious of being angry? Well, uh, so let let me say the following about the sound of the tautology. Uh, I we use the word conscious in 
and consciousness in somewhat different ways. So I can be conscious of something. Uh, I can be conscious of you now seeing your picture on this computer. Uh, and that's one way that we use the word conscious. I can be conscious of the desk over here and so forth. I can be conscious of many things. One of the things that I can be conscious of or aware of, and I think conscious of or aware of are pretty much equivalent. Uh, one of the things that I can be aware of it, are my own mental states. And uh, so, I, so far as being conscious or aware of them, they are equivalent. Now, there's a question, which is, Speaking of a mental state as being conscious or not a conscious, and this is a kind of usage which, so far as I can make it, at least in English, and I've been told in other European languages, not current till the 19th century. And I saw that it was not current till the 19th century because people did not think that mental states as ever failing to be conscious. Uh, now, that's a slightly peculiar thing because I think in Greek tragedy and in Shakespeare, I think in Chekhov, uh, I think in many dramatists, you see cases where we like to say the person is angry, but it is unaware of being angry. And so that's a case where we would say maybe the state is not a conscious state. In any case, I think that a theory of consciousness must accommodate this difference. So I can be angry, I can be angry and aware of being angry, but I think I can be angry unaware of being angry. And somebody could say to me, hey, what's wrong? You seem to be angry. And then two things might happen. I might say, oh, goodness, I am angry. I realize that. And then I might even be aware of why I'm angry, what I'm angry about, or I might not be. But another thing could happen. So I'm acting in an angry way. I'm raising my focus and so forth. And you say to me, David, why are you angry? And I could say, I'm not angry. And I'd say it in a very angry, wonderful face. So I might continue to be aware of being angry, even though my behavior and my the way I'm speaking, my body language, my expression, all of those reveal to anybody who sees me and that I am angry. So the distinction between conscious and unconscious cases, that's what I think is crucial. And that's what I think the Trinity principle reflects. And I do think the activity principle, the principle that a state is conscious only if one is in some way aware of it, I think that that is something just a piece of common sense. And I think it's used in everyday contexts, like the case of anger that we were just talking about. I think it's also used in experimental psychology. Uh, experimental psychologists run various kinds of tests. For example, they may show you something on the screen that you won't see conflict. And the way they tell that you don't see it consciously is to say, I didn't see anything. Presumably, I didn't see anything. You're reflecting what you believe about. So, so you're saying, I'm not aware of having seen anything. So the difference between conscious and unconscious seeing, subliminal seeing, and conscious seeing, this can be a matter whether you're aware of the same. If you're aware, then in its conscious appearance, it's subliminal. Uh, you talk about thoughts, 
Your theory is a theory of, of high order thought. Uh, but uh, thoughts are, according to you, thoughts are intentional, not only to you, of course. Uh, thoughts are intentional mental states. But look, what kind of entities are intentional mental states? And what makes them mental? Well, I think that the kind of entity is that they are states of the individual. Mm -hmm. So, that, that's not so. There can be all manner of states that somebody is in. I see something in the state of me. Um, maybe if I'm sitting up, that's the state of me. Thoughts are just another kind of states. There is a state presumably that involves certain areas of the cortex in the brain. What makes them mental? Um, I think that that's a delicate question because there is a big philosophical tradition. People usually this philosophical tradition to that part that goes back both way to Aristotle. I think not to Sir Plato. Plato is clear on this. Uh, there is a tradition that says something to be state, like a thought, a perception, feeling. So it must be a conscious state. You must be aware. Descartes was very clear about this. Aristotle was very clear about this in several places. And so put an instant to your question, is it that make the thought or any other state a mental state, then that would fall out a higher order degree, and it would indeed fall out the occurrence of any that are not conscious. Uh, so I want to give a different kind of answer to that question, and I consider two kinds of answers that would be appropriate, I think. One is, I think, a perfectly good answer, though it's not going to be very satisfying to everybody who thinks about this. Uh, we know more of what intentional content is. Uh, intentional content is whatever is captured by that clause. It's a sentence normalization, like that is rain. We can that it is rain. We can have weather it's rain. So forth. Uh, we also have some grasp of what the qualitative properties are. The, the qualitative properties of person A, when C red, or I hear the scent of a then or a cow, or touch a certain thing. Uh, the feeling of something is being hot being cold, and so forth. And so I think we can find the mental state, we can say that a state is mental, if either it has intentional properties or quality. Um, that is a kind of answer that some people would object to because they will say, well, to be mental is one thing. You're getting a disjunctive thing. You're saying metal if it's there A B. Uh, and we would give us one answer. I think that many things that common sense takes to be just unitary turn out to be actually this or that or the other. So you can't always trust the idea that something's unitary. Uh, but I do have something to say about it's being. I do have something to say about what it is that makes a mental state mental. That is unitary. And that is, it's the kind of state could occur, even if it doesn't always occur, as a kind of state. And both intentional states and quantitative states are states that occur sometimes just. And if it's a kind of state that would occur consciously, it counts as mental. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And um, what kind of theory um, um, is your theory? Um, how would I thought theory? Is it empirical or conceptual, for example, or mixing together conceptual and empirical elements? Well, I follow a tradition in the second half of the century, engineered by philosophers such as Beauty Point and Wilfred Stelfers, in denying that there really is a good distinction here between empirical and uh, So, supposing I had a theory of physics. Um, would that be, it, it certainly couldn't be straightforward empirical in a way that you may see here. Uh, it's very, very abstract in the way that many theories are. On the other hand, it's not conceptual because it has empirical content. It can be tested, even if it's tested at dimensions. So I think my higher thought theory is a theory, and it formulates ways in which things occur at some removal from the empirical. But still, it has empirical consequences at every point. Uh, I've just actually finished uh, writing an article with a young neuropsychologist at Columbia University, which will come out next month. There's an advance on the um, top already available. Um, and he's very interested in higher theories. And we wrote this article together uh, giving neuropsychological evidence that the higher theory of consciousness is the way to go. So I don't want to think of the theory as being purely conceptual at all, though it's just a fair amount of abstract and straightforward planning. Maybe it would be uh, uh, good uh, to explain your theory by comparing it with the alternatives, contemporary alternatives. Uh, for instance, uh, with uh, Bennett's uh, multiple drafts modal and uh, bars uh, the global workspace theory. Can you give us, uh, you know, your 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 uh, understanding of the uh, of the comparison? Certainly, although I say since since then, a consciousness of client book I've written to do to me or five things. Out of it. And I changed my mind from the time of that what the relationship is in his theory. Uh, so let me start with Barr's workspace theory, and then I'll come back to the uh, The global theory, which is in effect in that box notion of it. Says business is that a mental state is if it's available to what uh, processing, real process in the room, uh, and for available for use in a lot of the things that we do psychologically. And this has been, this theory has been developed in a neuronal way by. Uh, Stanislaus Kahn, people in his life in Paris. Uh, and there's very so neuropsychological work coming out of this with that. Uh, there's a question about that. Uh, the question that I have for that kind of theory is the following uh, Is it the case that every state that we count as countries is going to have global connections. And I think that the answer is, so for example, consider peripheral 
That is to say, consider we see consciously at the edges of our visual defeat. Uh, not so far that it's not conscious anymore, just very far out. It's conscious. Now, those states, those visual states that are very peripheral, are conscious, because we didn't go far out, so we stopped being conscious, but they clearly do not have very much effect on the rest of our subconscious processor. So that's one kind of example to the idea that if a state is conscious, then it's going to have all these low But there's kind of counter I think in the opposite direction also. There are states that presumably have at least reasonable number of actions that are not conscious. Uh, so the most widely known example of this, of course, is pretty unrepressed states. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. I don't think that there are lots of such states, but that's a special kind of theorizing I don't want to get into. But there are a lot of cases in which people desire something, and the desires big effect on their behavior, and they go in this way and that way, and yet the people are completely aware of those desires. And there are a lot of cases in which problem solving sort or another place with being conscious. So there's a problem that one has, maybe the problem in philosophy. What am I going to say in the next paragraph? a paper that I'm writing. I've just come up against a brick wall and what to say next. Or I've been traveling to talk to several different places and trying to figure out what the maximum uh, uh, efficient way to do this is and how to schedule it. It just doesn't make sense. And I go to bed, get up the next morning, immediately I see the answer. And I see the answer as a bottom line to result, but I also see all of the conditions that make that the answer. And this is thinking that presumably occurred when the thinking was in conscious. And it presumably had to draw on lots of different connections on my desires, on my beliefs, and so forth. Uh, and it doesn't have to happen when I'm asleep. It could just be, I go for a walk, and I don't think about problem anymore. And also, it all comes to me, as though I had worked out that. And I did, I said, but the most contrary. So these are cases where mental states have reasonably good connections with different parts of my psychological processing, but the states aren't known. So I think that's a difficulty with global workspace theories, and I think it's a difficulty with networks, notion, access, consciousness as well. Uh, now, Dennett. Dennett is complicated because the theory of consciousness he develops is against the background of his intentional stance theory of mind in general. And the intentional stance theory of mind in general is that mental states are patterns of inputs and outputs at a very high level that result in speech behavior and other kinds of behavior under various circumstances. And then it is clear that you could see behavior that he calls the design states, as though these are machines built to do something. Or you could even see it in principle from the physical states, that is to say, a few of the neurons of work. 
But if you did, you'd, if you skip the intentional fence, you would miss what that called real patterns. So you would miss the actual event. Uh, now, what then about consciousness? Consciousness is going to be very close to a binary theory on identity. Because, in effect, what, what it's going to be is that consciousness of mental states will be a case of one's thinking that one is in that state. So if I say I'm angry, or if I say I see something, or if I say I think something, these are cases where there is consciousness, according to data. So what's the difference between that and a high square theory? The difference is that then it doesn't think that what's underneath is an actual full mental state. What he calls this is an event of content fixation. So what I think the best way to characterize Dennett's theory is high order thoughts without the mental states they are at. Dennett is a chapter in his book, not just to explain chapter 10, which he takes on uh, the challenge of high order theory. He says this, he doesn't think there are all these levels. Right? So there is consciousness, there is the higher order level, but the lower order level must be a neural event that then it calls content. Events of content. And my challenge to Dennett is in effect, why do you call this events of content exception? You could call them the way the rest of us call them. You could say they're thoughts, feelings, perceptions. Mm -hmm. Well, let us consider one example of the P phenomenon, which is an optical illusion of movement formed by a perception of uh, succeeding uh, images. Based on this phenomenon uh, and some other temporal anomalies, then it concludes that there is no fact of the matter when some process becomes conscious. Well, you suggest otherwise. How would you, in principle, be able to distinguish between two options? In you know, if we're talking about p phenomena, one option: uh, hot about the static image occurred, but was just very brief to be recorded, which is uh, uh, one alternative, and the second alternative. Hot did not occur at all. In other words, uh, in Venice terms, how would you distinguish between the Stalinist and the Arulian uh, alternatives of interpretation of P phenomena? I think the problem with the way Bennett approaches this is that he insists that we draw the distinction that you just mentioned uh, from essentially an interesting point of view. This is what he calls his first person journalism. And it's, it's, if there's a distinction to be made, then it's going to be a distinction that the individual can make on his or her own. And I think that's obviously very limiting. The way that I propose the distinction is, I mean, we can't do this right now. But in this time, eventually, we will know, at least for a particular individual, maybe to some extent a plus individual, we will know that there is a higher so it's this set of neurons in this particular way. And we'll know when that and there won't be any question about it. Uh, we already have a pretty good idea. As my colleague, uh, while I argued this paper that's coming out soon, we have a pretty good idea of where the higher order states are. They would be dark, black, prefrontal, or very near there. Um, prefrontal cortex is pretty small, and it does a lot of things. So the trouble is, it's not near the surface of the brain. It's very hard to tell what's going on here. 
with that in methods which we can use uh, on humans. There's some question which we should be using other animals, um, but we simply don't have to answer that as to what neural event is a higher order robot or even a first order. And we will eventually, uh, we have a lot of knowledge of certain states, vision, and uh, addition and addition. Uh, we can locate them uh, and we can locate the time. We, we can fix them temporarily, pretty accurately. Uh, the question is how to get them to frontal protect and have the time fixed by your thoughts. And we can't do that yet. That's the way that we build the baby. They recently you have developed a theory of qualitative, qualitative mental states. Can you tell us some details of the theory? Certainly. Uh, the, the problem about qualitative states being conscious is, I think, the most pressing issue for anybody who deals with consciousness. Uh, and it's a, it's a very important issue. Let me say a couple of preliminary things before I get to my own fear. I spoke before of a prediction in philosophy says for a state to be a mental state, it must be conscious. Now, people, I think, today, in knowledge, most people recognize uh, that there are many kinds of mistake occur without being conscious. For example, beliefs and desires and so forth. Uh, there's still a question, however, in the minds of many as to whether qualitative states such as bodily sensations and perceptual sensations can occur without being conscious. And I think the prevailing view today is that they cannot. And if we think that they cannot, then I, this leads to many very grave difficulties. It leads to what David challenges the heart problem, and leads to what those mean for the explained gap. And let me take a moment about the third thing, uh, it leads to the idea that when I see red, that is to say, I see an object red, and you see the sun, it's a red object, perhaps your real experience is the same kind of experience that I have when I see a green object. And the problem here is that we accept that there's no way to tell about qualitative states except by consciousness. That is to say, except by the way the states present themselves to consciousness. Your states present themselves to your consciousness, mind to my consciousness. If we accept that, then there's no way to compatibility between your states and these states. We're just completely lost. So the issue about whether qualitative states occur without being conscious it is, I think, perhaps the biggest issue in possibly consciousness today. And the first thing I want to say about the issue is people very often appeal to what they call intuitions. And this appeal, at least in the English-speaking world philosophy, has become very popular with players from Socrates, Grand Britain lectures, and in the Sethi, in the Sethi. And now many, many people that say, well, it's my intuition that such and such 
and you know, my intuition, so, so, and that's the end of it. I think this is not a good way to do philosophical thinking. Uh, the reason is people differ about their intuitions, and then what are they supposed to do? They just can't talk to them. But the other thing is, have to examine whether things that pre theoretic common sense intuitions are really creatures of a theory. So if I say I have an intuition, maybe what I'm doing is just packaging my deep in a very intuitive way. Uh, this is what Dennett used to call intuition pumps. But then it recognizes that these intuition pumps are really just devices in order to get you to agree with my theory. So I think we should not appeal to intuitions. We should appeal to theories and see which theories deal with the things that we want them to deal with in the most successful way. Now, the theory that qualitative states never occur without being constructs results in a big thing, I think, even critically speaking. Uh, and people who adopt this view agree with what I'm saying. They just don't think it's fair. Maybe they think it's fair, but it's just the way to go. The consequence of thinking this is that there's almost nothing to say about what positive properties are. I know what they are from the inside, but that's what we can prove. Right? And, you know, I can hope to know what they are from the inside, too, and that we can talk a little bit. But there isn't much more to be said. Uh, I think that that is a difficulty about thinking about all the properties as being necessarily complex. And so it's against this background I offer a Think about qualitative properties, mental qualities, independent how they present themselves to individual consciousness. And it builds up from perception. So consider any individual or another all that has sexual abilities and for convenience, just let's talk for a month about vision. So we each have the ability to discriminate visible properties. I can discriminate between red and green, I can discriminate visually between shape and that shape, and I can make very clean discrimination. And many of the experiments I make, even when interesting, is subliminal. In fact, the more we investigate the degree of brain discrimination that possible subliminal vision, the more surprising it is. It seems to be just about as good, sometimes even better, because now, suppose I discriminate this perceptible property from this one. It must be become in two different states. And it's natural that the two different states are visual states, because I'm discriminating between two properties visually. And since the two states are different, Visually, they must be really in respect visual qualities because in the conscious case, I can discriminate these things. I can discriminate them because they have just visual experiences and different qualities. Except we now know that we can do this also 
even when visual states are not conscious. So if you take the sum total all of the discriminations that a person can make set in respect of color, in respect of the color of physical object that we make. If you take that sum total, what you get is a what people call a quality expense that reflects the similarities and differences between every two discriminable colors. There are technical issues about this that people discuss that the best contemporary person is Austin Clark, which is a philosopher who has practiced the as a physician half a dozen years before he worked in the philosophy. So he really knows what he's talking about. But let's take the technical details as given. Now we have a quality effect which presents all of the physical colors that I can discriminate. And we've already figured out that we can discriminate them because they're in different qualitative states. So this quality effect also map the metal qualities in virtue of which I can do this. And it maps them independent of how those metal qualities present consciousness. So we're halfway there. We have an account of metal qualities that is independent of the metal quality in consciousness. But we know metal qualities are very unconscious. So what I do is I take this quality space theory, as I call it, I put it together with a higher order theory of consciousness. And the higher order theory of consciousness has a particular state with metal quality. Be a conscious state only if I'm aware of and the way that I'm aware, where it me, is that I will have a thought to the effect that I'm in that state. Mm -hmm. And how will the thought describe the state? It'll describe it in terms of this family of similarity and differences. So in a weaker set of similar ways and differences is available to the way I think about things, I won't be conscious of my qualitative states in such a fine brain way. And we have examples of this. So for people when they're very young learn that these discriminations of color, shape, so forth, um, very, very early, so they build up concepts for these differences. But the concepts are partly concepts that have to do with specific regions of space, like red region. But they're partly qualitative differences reflected comparatively. So I able to make very Funny brain differences depending on whether I can compare this mentality with another. So there's a very well known psychological root result, according to which it show you one patch of color and another one, but I don't show you together. I'm not very good at going fine brain discrimination. But if I show both of them together, I can tell if they're the same or different. And this reflects the idea that many of the ways in which we're aware of the qualities are comparing. And if I don't have something to compare, then I won't be able to make some fine and discrimination. I'll have to be left with fewer ways of being aware 
of email service. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, specify how um, your theory deals with Chalmers' hard problem of conscience? How do you, how do you solve this problem? Or this well, solve? The hard problem of consciousness, as I understand it, is the problem about why a particular neural state should be associated with a particular conscious experience as opposed to some other conscious experience, or perhaps no conscious experience at all. And we begin, on my view, by seeing that certain neural processes are implicated in discriminating various perceptual properties. So I've got red and green, and I've some processes that do red and some neural processes that do pink. And so that makes a good sense. There, there's no mystery about that. Uh, we can understand why this process and stuff, that neural process, tracing it back red and seeing you know, which of the uh, side percent receptive cells is actually to extend and then the component process the optic nerve is produced. So we have perfectly good understanding what happens in the cortex in the back of the head on the basis of what happens before that. Uh, but Chance would say, well, this has nothing to do with the problem he's interested in. Because the problem that he's interested in it is this vision. And he wants to know why a particular neural process should not be a conscious experience of red as opposed to a conscious experience of green. And all I'm talking about is unconscious perception. So, but Chandra's in, in effect assuming the denial of your theory. That is to say, he's assuming that a, an experience of red will have consciousness built into it. Whereas a higher order theory says, look, there's one thing that is the state of perceiving red. And there's another thing in virtue which that's his interest. So, again, he's permitted to say what's going on neurally. We need to know what processes neurally respond to a thought that I have experienced. And what processes respond to a thought that I have experienced. And if you put that two things together, that is to say, the quality of work with the conscience, then I think it looks more like you have a problem that's difficult to resolve. If you distinguish the two, then it's a perfectly straightforward way in which you can understand why one neural process responds to a metal quality of red, and another, the metal quality of red being conscious. And I think that there's no problem. Let's suppose, uh, as a continuation, uh, let's suppose that a robot, robot discriminates some colors. He has, or he or she or it, has some inner states which correspond to the physical colors. My question is, are these inner states of robot are quality in your sense? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Are what? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, again, I tell this again. Let's suppose a thought experiment, or not a thought experiment, it's a real situation. Let's suppose we have a robot. Robot. No. Do you understand me? Robot. Machine. Machine with. Okay. Yes, a robot. I'm robot. sorry. Yes. yes. Robot. And this robot 
can discriminate some colors. He look and looks on red and says it's red. It's look at, at something yellow and says it's yellow and so on. It's a real situation, even now, even these days. And this robot has some uh, inner states, inner states which corresponds to colors. One, its inner sta states correspond to yellow, physical yellow. Uh, another inner states correspond to red and so on. And my question is, are these inner states of robot quality in your sense? Well, I prefer not to use well, uh, states. Well, let me explain why. I think when people speak of qualities with consciousness, I want to just discriminate theoretical and the of the qualification. So, but with, with that, I think so. I think today probably do not any but that are elaborate enough so that we set that they are in quality steps. Why is that? Well, from the point of view of my qualities. They may be able to do everything, but the vision robots now have is not embedded in a very developed way in other kinds of machine. So they don't even measure up to monkey or bird or I don't know very much about fish, uh, but they really don't have logical function in that way. And will the we have robots that do? I think probably yes. Uh, will, they, will those robots be in what I would call qualitative states? I think uh, I see no reason to think that uh, it has to be made of neurons as opposed to whatever we make our robots out of. But I, I think that day is a long ways off. Uh, I don't, and I don't think that artificial intelligence is the right person Because I think artificial intelligence is an effect trying to simulate uh, intelligence. I think deeper theorizing must be done about what the psychological functioning of a person or an animal is before we'll really know how to conduct robots with this very kind of function. So maybe a very important question, but I guess you give a brief answer. Uh, how um, your theory, how do you, uh, how your theory explains such things as mental causation, for example, uh, or freedom of will? Or your theory uh, has no relation to these problems? Uh, I have worked very much with mental causation. Because I guess I don't really understand what the problem is. I'm actually organizing a small group uh, to talk with a neuropsychologist uh, from Paris in a few weeks about mental causation. But I don't see what the problem is. I take it that mental states simply are mental states, and mental states much various things. So maybe we can at least put manifestation to one side. Uh, so far as free will was concerned, uh, 
My own view is that the serious problem is what I think there is rebuilt. Uh, and the reason I think there is rebuilt is pretty simple. Uh, and by the way, so far as I can tell, they really think that common sense idea that there is free will does not relate to any mental states that are not conscious. It only relates to the ones that are conscious. So suppose I want to do something and think, well, I'm going to, and I do it. And I say, well, this is an example of free will. Why does it seem free? It seems free because we don't know cause it. It's not that nothing goes or to be more cautious about it. We have no idea that nothing caused. All we know is that I am not aware of anything caused. So what we do know is I made this decision and I did it action, and I know what anything caused my decision or not. Maybe nothing did, and then free. It's caused. But maybe something did, and I'm just not aware of what did. Uh, so I think that the high order theory helps with someone because it distinguishes, as I think is very important, between the decision and being aware of the decision. Uh, there's work by famously Benjamin that, and, and uh, more recently Richard in London, uh, and it's been replicated in many labs here and there. There are people are instructed to engage in some very basic act, like pushing a button or something. And what they're supposed to do is just decide, and I'll do this now. I'll press the button now. And they're supposed to look at a clock that's rotating and notes when they made that decision. But they're also wired up. Uh, to the relevant parts of the game, and is called a readiness potential, which is a brain event that seems to be implicated in the decision. That occurs somewhere between a half and a third second before people report the decision. So it's very natural to think what's going on here is the vision comes first. The awareness of the vision is different event comes a little bit, and that that what this experimental work shows. Uh, Libet himself did not agree with this perfectly. Uh, he and I argued this, uh, but I think it is the most possible interpretation uh, of this work, and. If this interpretation is correct, it tends to tip against free will because it's just there are these events that happen that lead to our action and to become aware of the events that lead to the actions after the events have already occurred. Uh, Lubit himself had an argument which I believe Patrick heard also accept, but I think he shouldn't, which was designed to stay well. And that is, what happens is you decide to press the button. There's a finite potential particular moment. And before you actually press the button, you can, a little bit said, veto that. Uh, decision. But the vetoing, another conscience, 
decision. So now we have the possibility that there's an unconscious vetoing followed by an awareness of the unconscious veto. That's much harder to measure. We don't really know, we don't have the ability yet to determine whether that's true. Uh, but the reason I think the main result that it would be true. Thank you. Uh, and two, maybe, final questions. Uh, let's, uh, first of them, let's discuss, uh, turn our discussion to the other side, and maybe let's discuss a bit your writing style. Your writing style. Mm, uh, you told, uh, told today mm, uh, some interesting things about your papers, mm, but it's evident that you prefer writing papers, not books, papers. Uh, why? Why is it so? Like, uh, uh, that's a good question, and think that although that is certainly my preference, I sometimes think perhaps it shouldn't be. Uh, my articles are typically very packed, so that there is, or in them, there is in the agricultural left. And I think that's a good thing in some ways, but it's a bad thing in some ways. It makes the articles harder to read. And it makes, to the extent that which they're less, as say in English, less user-friendly. Uh, perhaps many of the things set as points of detail spent over the book. And people say, well, there's so much going on. can't all be relevant, and they just get them. And so that's a, just the advantage, from my point of view, and I don't mean to be suggesting that it waits the designated. It's just, it was an advantage. It, it gets in the very small a great deal of material. So I think sometimes the amount of material that one of their books might actually have a small. And the best example is I point to you. Uh, the the bit I published, Conscious Mind, uh, six years ago, uh, has mostly previously published papers. Uh, some of them a bit revised, one of them quite a bit revised, uh, and some of them entirely never published before. And it's a very long, and what I know, quality state, uh, which is just by itself a subsequent among there, and could have been a book. And I think it would have been better if it had been a book. And perhaps some time I'll take that material, some material, and make a small book out of it. You're quite right that that is a writing style that's slightly unusual and has disadvantages as well as a hope advantage. Well, uh, we're coming to a conclusion, uh, and uh, our last question is about uh, uh, your life. Uh, is this uh, style, style, style of your life? Style of your life, yes. Is, uh, are you living uh, some kind of philosophical life? Is there any specific things that are uh, special in your life uh, due to philosophy? Uh, a lot of my it is my personal life, both writing and lecturing, uh, doing things like this, you, uh, teaching. And in addition to my regular 
first every semester to the university graduate center and run a speaker series in cognitive science that meets most weeks throughout the year. Uh, so later this afternoon, it's just this afternoon up here in New York, uh, we'll actually have a young psychologist to my group. Uh, other than that, I have friends, I play piano, I have a son who is a lawyer at New York. Uh, I enjoy traveling. Um, I enjoy like being in New York. Are these the kinds of that you're asking? Well, yes. Yes, of course. Well, uh, I think our interview is coming to an end. Uh, David, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for this well, opportunity. Very interesting. Well, answers. it's been a pleasure for me. Um, I have the Rosenthal's in family. My great grandmother came from um, what was then a part of Russia. Uh, it's now for the, the Ukraine, a separate country. Uh, and so, but he, he was from Ukraine. Uh, in his culture was completely Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so his first language, my father's first language, uh, was Russian. And father told me, I don't know how I could ever relate. I had relatives in Scarab somewhere. I don't know the names. So I, I the next is Russia. And so it's a particular pleasure to be able to have this interview. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.